so welcome to our lesson and uh, I'm going to look at a paper which is uh, so going to look at science that is a paper which was done in the year 2019 KCP of course so very fast and to take you through a very important part of this and uh, to start with you should know that uh, We've always advised that you read the instruction before you take the paper because in most cases you may find an, a hint to what you're going to see. Now look at this case. At the back of the paper there was this question that was later retested in the paper. The question is, which one of the following components of blood is involved in clotting after an injury? Now look at that. Of course blood clotting that is platelets. So you are told that the correct answer is D, meaning that the answer is platelets. Well, inside the paper, question number 30 was testing on a similar thing. Look at this. Which one of the following components of blood is correctly matched to its function? So we have plasma, transports oxygen. Of course, oxygen is transported by the red blood cells and not plasma. White blood cells, heat distribution, heat distribution is plasma. And then platelets, blood clotting. Look at that. Here we had blood clotting, platelets. So a similar question is tested. And the answer which was in the example is the answer that is now in the paper. So if you read the instruction, if you didn't know the answer, then definitely you are given what I would call a bonus. So that is the importance of reading the instruction. I welcome you to the paper that we're going to discuss now. And uh, I'll start right from the first question. Now number one says, which of the following pairs of human body parts is used in breathing? Now that is part of the breathing system. And so of course you understand that breathing system, we have the nose, we have the trachea, we have the bronchus, we have the bronchioles, we have the lungs, we have the alveolus. Looking at this, the lungs is part of the breathing system. The lungs is part of the breathing system. Esophagus, this is digestion. The nose and the trachea, that is right. Diaphragm is part of the breathing system, but the stomach here is wrong. So this is part of the digestive system. And then the last choice, we have the nose and the esophagus. This one is wrong. This one is wrong here. So in this case, you realize that parts of the breathing system, we have the nose and the trachea, which is also called the windpipe. The windpipe. Next question, we are told that which one of the following waste products is excreted by the lungs. Now this is about the excretory system of the body. So the excretory organs are majorly three. The first excretory organ is the skin, which removes sweat. And sweat is a mixture of excess water. excess salt, urea, and lactic acid. So that is what is removed by the skin. We have the lungs, which is another excretory organ, which removes carbon dioxide and excess water. And then finally, we have the kidney, which removes urine 
and urine is also made up of excess water, excess salt, urea, and other poisonous substances like medicines. So we have majorly three excretory organs, the skin, the lungs, and the kidney. So looking at what they remove from the body, which ones are excreted by the lungs? So obviously we see that the lungs will remove carbon dioxide, which is the main one, and excess water. So in this case, we will pick our answer as excess water. Why do we say excess? It's because the body needs water and it will only get rid of that water when it is in excess. The same thing applies to salts. So you don't just say that uh, water and salts, no. The body needs it and it is not a waste product. But it becomes a waste product when it is in excess. So look at the waste products. You will see we have excess water, excess salt, urea, lactic acid. Urea and lactic acid are completely removed because they are not needed by the body. But because water and salt are needed, so only the excess is removed in that case. So that was the question number two, and I look at the third one now. It says, which one of the following pairs of diseases only consist of sexually transmitted infection, the so-called STIs? Now, we have different classes of diseases that you should know. There is a class of diseases called deficiency diseases. We also have the STIs, communicable diseases, and then they have the immunizable diseases, and then we also have the waterborne. So these are some of the categories of diseases that you should know as a learner. I will be very brief about each of them. Deficiency diseases are diseases that we contract when we lack certain nutrients in our body. When the body is deficient in certain nutrients, like we have rickets, marasmus, kwashiorkor, anemia, Goita, Beriberi, and much more. Unlike the other types of diseases, it's only the deficiency diseases that cannot be transmitted. So for example, there is no way you can contract marasmus from someone. STIs, sexually transmitted infections, are transmitted when there is mixing of blood or body fluids, especially during sexual intercourse, deep kissing, or such activities. For example, a common one is HIV, gonorrhea, we have syphilis, chancroid, herpes, and much more. And then we have communicable. A communicable disease is a disease that can be transferred from one person to another. So they can be transmitted by certain organisms and that, which will help in spreading them. So a good example is malaria, which is caused by a parasite called plasmodium. So it's proper to know what causes it and what spreads it. So malaria is caused by the parasite called plasmodium which actually invades the red blood cells and then is transmitted or it is spread by the female anopheles mosquito. Another communicable disease is what we call the tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a bacterial disease. It's caused by the bacteria that attacks the lungs and it is transmitted through air, so that is an airborne disease. 
So those are some of the communicable diseases that we have. And then we have immunizable disease is a disease for which there is a vaccine that can be used to prevent it. And to start with, the first one is what we again call the tuberculosis. I'll simply write it as the TB, that is first immunizable disease. Of course, we have pertussis, which is also called whooping cough. We have polio. We have measles. And then we have the waterborne diseases. These are diseases that are transmitted by contaminated water. And so here we have cholera, typhoid, bilharzia. Of course, we have the dysentery, but that is not common right now. So those are the diseases that we have in that category. So looking at the STIs, gonorrhea is there, malaria is just a communicable disease, HIV, right, but measles is an immunizable disease. Syphilis and chancroid is right, and then bilharzia is waterborne. So that is how you get your answer. The next question says, which of the following is the third stage of HIV and AIDS infections? Remember the stages of HIV and AIDS infections because that is important as well. We have the first stage, which is the window. Stage two, which is asymptomatic or incubation. The third stage, symptomatic stage or the symptom showing stage and then the last stage where we have the full-blown AIDS. Now that is the order of those stages but knowing the order is not very important if you don't know what happens in each, each stage. So let's see briefly what is in the window stage. This is the first stage as we've indicated there it takes between four to six weeks. Now, in the window stage, of course, that is the first stage of infection. And uh, the first thing that you need to understand about this stage, it's very simple. One, you have the virus. You have the HIV, but no signs. And because you don't have the signs, so we, we say that you don't have AIDS yet. So no AIDS. Remember, HIV is different from AIDS. AIDS comes in the third stage. That is symptomatic stage. So in this case, there is no AIDS. And then you look healthy. But, of course, the test will not even find the disease. So when an ELISA test is carried out, it, the test gives a negative result. So the patient also tests negative. So it is not easy. You can't know that someone has the disease when it is within the, but still there is a major thing that we must note here, that you can transmit it. One can infect the others. So look at that. When you are tested, you test negative, but you can infect. So that makes window stage the most dangerous stage of HIV. Because you infect others without knowing. So that is one thing that you should know about this stage. Incubation. Incubation stage or what I call asymptomatic. Now this stage can take like 6 weeks in some people. Others it goes up to 12 years. So it depends on the person. But... In children, it will take like very few days. That is why it's not easy for children to live with HIV for a very long time because their body does not have 
the robust or very strong immune system. So they easily die because the body is unable to fight this virus. So, but in adults, you will find they live with the disease up to 12 years before the disease will start showing any sign. So in the incubation stage, there are no signs. So we can't tell you look healthy as usual. Looking at someone, you don't know if they have the disease or not. But when tested, the test will show a positive result. So if the person tests positive, showing that now they are infected. So meaning that when we carry out the ELISA test, the test for HIV is called ELISA test. It will tell us that the body has started producing the antibodies against the antigen in the blood, which is HIV. So that will tell you that the person is already infected and the body is trying to react to that, is trying to fight the germs by producing the antibodies. So the antibodies or the chemicals which are supposed to be fighting the germs. Now this is what we test in the body in the ELISA test. So there are no signs but you test positive you can infect others and of course I've said it lasts between six weeks up to 12 years in mature people and that. So apart from the incubation or asymptomatic stage we have the third stage. So this third stage is uh, symptomatic. Now this is often called the symptom showing stage. In this stage, we begin to see the symptoms and signs are visible. And because of that, so we say that now someone has AIDS. So in other words, I would say that this is the first stage of AIDS, but the third stage of HIV, right? So this is the time we know that now you have the virus because we will see these infections on you. And so these infections are called the opportunistic infections. So at this point, you begin to have the opportunistic diseases. For example, you begin to have the tuberculosis. You can have pneumonia. You could have some coughs some rashes on the skin and many other diseases that now will come in and remember we call them opportunistic because they take advantage of the weak immune system that has been destroyed by the virus in the third stage now to manifest themselves and to express on your body showing the signs everywhere so that now even when someone walks, you can easily notice and say that person has HIV. Because now you're able to see the signs and the symptoms on them. The final stage is the full-blown AIDS. The full-blown AIDS. Now in this case, this is the last stage. And here... The immunity has completely been weakened and so it cannot fight much. So at that point you may be bedridden, unable to do very many things, that is what we expect. And then because of the opportunistic diseases, the person finally dies. So we have death. So you finally die because of the opportunistic diseases or other infections, we call it the secondary infections. This is when you are already infected, then you are reinfected. So you can die because of opportunistic diseases or you can die because of the secondary infections. So that is about the last stage of HIV infection. So in this case, the third stage of HIV infection is the symptomatic or the symptom showing stage. 
Now, question five, which of the following components of environment is the main source of energy for living things? Now, look at that. Main source of energy for living things. So, living things here are plants and animals. So, that means that this choice is not there. Because plants cannot be source of energy for plants. So that, that gives me the three remaining choices. Now, the main source of energy in an ecosystem is the sun. So the first, the main source of energy is sunlight. Actually, it is the most important source of energy because one, it provides heat and light for the animals and plants. Remember, light is what plants use. To make their food and heat is also necessary for one germination in plants and even the functionality of the organs in both plants and animals so sunlight is the most important source of energy for plants and animals of course the next most important one is water because water is necessary plants obtain water from their habitat same to animals which can be from the soil and there are those which live directly in water. So it is required by both plants and animals for a number of reasons. It prevents dehydration. It is used to make the body fluids for transportation and many other things. And then we have air, which is also very necessary for plants and animals. Apart from air, we have the food or the nutrients which they will obtain from their habitat with the right temperature. So these are some of the things that living organisms will require. They need sunlight, they need water, they need air, food or nutrients and the habitat where they live their home in that case. So according to the choices that we have, the main source, okay, the rest are also sources of energy, but the main one here is water. If there was sunlight, you'd pick on that. So you need to understand that order and how crucial they are. The next question is talking about pollution. So which of the following least pollutes the soil? So when we talk about pollution of the soil, excess use of fertilizers, this will cause much pollution. Oil spillage, this causes much pollution. Kitchen leftovers will not pollute the soil as such. And then mining is a major cause of, a major cause of pollution. So in this case, we will have kitchen leftovers, which will cause minimal. Yes, it will cause some pollution, but minimal what? Pollution. 